then I could see why. Which gets me back to my friend the dancer describing this author that she was reading, bringing it up through his or her body <clears throat> kind of way. It's a whole world apprehended and created through the gut, the heart, the loins, the brain, as through stone, earth, minerals, water, wood, iron. The human being meeting the unknowability of his own passions, his own feelings, his society, his universe, his neighbor, his backyard. That's why I read. To feel that meeting and that touch translated into words, a little the primitive black and white words on the page to get taken into somebody's brain and explode in their brain. With sight, sound, pictures, wars, kings, queens, gangsters, lovers, anything you can imagine. I don't know about you guys, <laughs> but that's why. it's obvious to me. I know it, one really happened and the other one did not. <laughs> um, and, they, and they blend sometimes. But uh, to me it's, um, also, this is in my own work, um, fiction, uh, an interesting, very de good definition by Grace Paley. She said, um, nonfiction is writing that tells the truth. And fiction is a lie that tells the bigger truth. Um, also in a book of an interesting comment, this is an old story of his, but I okay, try to remember it exactly. The first fiction writer was born when the little boy ran out of the forest yelling, wolf, wolf, and there was no wolf. <coughs> and between the wolf in the tall grass and the wolf in the tall story, there's a shimmering go-between, and that go-between is the art of fiction. Well, um, a couple of things. Um, I was speaking specifically of fiction. I wasn't speaking of nonfiction or history or the stuff you read in the newspaper or magazines. I, I meant very specifically fiction. And it's simply true that people read it a lot less. That, that's just reality. If you go back to, to 1950s, many, many more readers of fiction. Also, even in the last 10 years, statistically, I don't know how they check these things, but I've, I've read um, polls, poll, you know, study after study, far fewer readers, period, actually, but far fewer readers of fiction. It, may, it could change. I mean, it's entirely possible that a different generation will come up. I hear in France that actually reading level, the, the number of people that read is going up in the last, I don't know how many years, but quite recently it started to come up quite dramatically. And in fact, I think in the last NEA poll, maybe two years ago, for the first time, instead of dropping precipitously, it had started to come up slightly. So that could change, but it is a, it's simply re a reality, and it's not lately, it's, it's been going on for quite a while. Um, but you're right, there is a, a, a crazy amount of stuff published. I mean, I remember maybe 10 years ago, there was a big flap because um, publishing houses, even before the crisis hit, had decided they were going to let go a lot of books. They weren't going to publish some of the books that they had on kind of in, in the backlog and they were letting go some of their authors and this was supposed to be a terrible tragedy and I thought, may not be. Because there's an awful lot of stuff out there that you, I don't know why it's published, frankly. Um, and not just because it doesn't sell, because it's, I, there's no life to it, it's dead. Um, but as to how you could tell the violinist, that is, that is a really hard thing to say. It's not what you're supposed to read though. Just forget about supposed to read. I don't read three quarters of what comes out, more than that. I don't feel at all compelled to read debut novelists, or anybody, actually. Um, I read Joseph Conrad for the first time last month. Um, I haven't read Anna Karenina. I, I will, but I'm slow. And that's fine with me. I don't feel like I'm supposed to. I mean, there's a little bit of that supposed to thing. I, I, would, I read Joseph Conrad because I did feel I should, but um, <laughs> I read Moby Dick for that reason. And, and I wasn't sorry. That's great. If you haven't read that, read it. <laughs> um, but uh, not net tomorrow. You can read it 20 years from now. It'll still be there. Um, but you, you just have to listen. You have to tune your listening. 
And I, I think that many people, if they're not too concerned with what it's supposed to be and what they have to read, and I don't mean that as critical of you, I understand where you're coming from, but I've had the experience of um, undergraduates who I'm teaching, even if they really don't like what I'm making them read, it bores them, understandably. They're being force-fed it. But even so, I feel they instinctively feel its power. Even if they can't take it in on a brain level, I feel they do know they're in the, power, they're in the presence of something powerful. I actually I remember when I um, first read Kafka, I was an undergraduate, I did love the penal colony. But I also didn't get it. Uh, and I had to read the castle and the trial, and I just didn't get it. And I knew I didn't get it. But I knew I was in the presence of something very powerful. And I knew I could go back and read it later, and I did. Same thing with Ulysses. Uh, I could get that better, but uh, part of the problem is I had to read it really fast and write something about it, which I had no desire to do. But, uh, but I knew this is there's something really there's something really deep here. And I read it later when I was 40 and, and thought it was one of the most beautiful things in the world. And remembered, actually, certain things about it, which amazed me that they had imprinted on my mind, even though I didn't like it.